Well, hello friends. It's been a little while. You may have noticed that there was no automotive history video dropping on my channel for a little bit of time. And you know why? This place. Yeah. My sister and I were busy opening a bar. This is the Annex, and if you're ever in South Texas, come visit us. And today we are going to be talking about Europe's longest continuously operating motorcycle manufacturer. A motorcycle brand that dominated the racing scene for about 30 years. A company that lost one of its three founders in a tragic plane crash. If you haven't already guessed it from the motorcycle we have above the bar, we are going to be talking all about the birth and history of Moto Guzzi. So let's do it. are not familiar with this channel, welcome. I cover some kind of automotive history or motorcycle history once a week, unless I'm opening a bar because I haven't posted anything in three months, but you get the drift. Automotive history is my hobby. If you like that kind of thing, press subscribe, press like, do whatever you'd like. And now we begin. It's 1921 in Mandello Delario, Italy, and two World War I pilots and their mechanic band together with a passion and a purpose to create Moto Guzzi. Could not have been more different. You had Giorgio Perotti, who was born to very wealthy ship owners. Giovanni Ravelli was the daredevil. He was known as a skilled pilot and racer. And then you had the man behind the nuts and bolts of it. Carlo Guzzi was the mechanic to these two World War I pilots. And he was behind the a very unfortunate tragedy. Ravelli would perish in an aircraft crash. The remaining founders, Prodi and Guzzi, would forever pay tribute to Ravelli with the eagle's wings on the Moto Guzzi logo. And now we're going to climb up there and take a closer look at the Moto Guzzi logo. You know why? Because I can. I own this bar. I can walk around barefoot. Totally fine. Actually, my shoes were squeaking and I didn't want to bug y'all with squeaky shoes in this video the whole time. All right, let's climb up here. Damn, my first rodeo. Sometimes you gotta dust up here. So, here we have. All right, well, clearly I haven't dusted in a little while. Get us some closer looks. So what was really cool in the early Moto Guzzi engines, every mechanic that put the motorcycle would sign it. This does not have a signature, it was not. It's a 1953 Moto Guzzi Falcone, so it was not that early on in the Guzzi year. And here is the eagle in its wings, forever paying tribute to Giovanni Ravelli. Well, since we're here, I'll give you a little closer look. Brutiful. So, this is a pretty sweet Let's see if I can get down here like a lady. Whee! Fabulous. All right, let's get back to the history. Now here is a fun little piece of trivia for you. The early Moto Guzzi motorcycles weren't actually Moto Guzzi. They were Guzzi Perotti, GP, until they changed their mark to Moto Guzzi. And you might be asking yourself, well, why did they do that? Well, Perotti, like I said, came from a lot of wealth and uh, his family did not necessarily want this risky venture, this risky motorcycle venture, to have their name on it. You know how I said earlier Moto Guzzi dominated for about 30 years in the racing scene? Well, they did. And winning races was your best form of advertising. As the old adage goes, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Moto Guzzi relied heavily on promoting their motorcycle company through winning races. In 1935 at the Isle of Man TT, one of their factory drovers scored a double victory. For the first 45 years of the company, Carlo Guzzi's designed horizontal single cylinder engine would be the dominant engine configuration of Moto Guzzi. Moto Guzzi would have just under 3,000 races under their belt. Eight world championships, six constructor world championships, and 11 Isle of Man TT victories. Not to get too ahead of myself, which I kind of did, but something important, and you may see this right here, it was also in Moto Guzzi's first year. They produced the first motorcycle featuring a center stand. 
In the 1930s, Moto Guzzi would introduce the GT500 Norge, which would take multiple long distance endurance records. Come World War II, like many other companies, Moto Guzzi would dive deep into the war effort, producing motorcycles for the Italian army. Well, post-World War II, there was not a lot of money and there was not a lot of petrol. So Moto Guzzi had to figure out how to make their motorcycles cheaper and lighter. Small, lightweight motorcycles like the 65cc Motor Leggera and the 175cc scooter the Galletto helped Moto Guzzi survive the post-World War II aftermath. But you know who did not welcome the Galletto? Well, long-standing Italian scooter manufacturers Piaggio and Lambretta. In fact, when Moto Guzzi said they were going to come out with a scooter, Lambretta threatened back that they would create a small V-twin motorcycle. So eventually the pair would compromise with neither one of them diving into each other's turf. The 1950s were the golden years of Italian motorcycle racing with Moto Guzzi, Mondial, and Gilera dominating the world of Grand Prix motorcycle racing. Moto Guzzi dominated the middleweight classes with their 250cc and 350cc motorcycles designed by Giulio Carcano. Carcano realized that lightness might not take all victories. And he went on to design the V8 500cc GP race bike that had one of the most complicated engine configurations of its time. Now, it did frequently win fastest lap. However, the V8 often did not completely finish a race due to mechanical problems. It was also in the 1950s that Moto Guzzi was one of the first motorcycle manufacturers to incorporate wind tunnels in their design. It's all about refining those aerodynamics. Moto Guzzi would earn a reputation for reliability and durability, making it a favorite for law enforcement and military agencies. And the 1960s would bring a little bit of a crisis mode to Moto Guzzi with the death of its founders and the retirement of Carlo Guzzi, the man behind the engineering. And the company was taken over by a state-controlled receiver, S-E-I-M-M. Societa Esercicio Industri Moto Meccanici, however you pronounce that in Italian. However, it was during these state-controlled years that one of the most iconic Moto Guzzi engine configurations was born. The air-cooled 90-degree V-twin with a longitudinal crankshaft and transverse cylinder heads on either side of the bike. And just a few short years later, Moto Guzzi would have yet another owner in 1973, and you might recognize this gentleman's name. Moto Guzzi was sold to Alejandro de Tommaso. Now, if you're ever interested, and you should be, in the history of Alejandro de Tommaso, because Homeboy had a very interesting life, check out this video. I have all about the history of him, his wife, who was an American heiress, and de Tommaso which brought the beloved Pantera and Mangusta. So it's a good one. You should watch it. That purchase also included Benelli and Maserati. And soon, under De Tommaso's leadership, the company, Moto Guzzi, would start turning profits. And in 1975, the Italian superbike we all know and love, one of the most iconic Moto Guzzi's, the 850 Le Mans, would be released. This superbike would spawn four later models. And now we're gonna fast forward a fair bit to 2000, when Aprilia would purchase Moto Guzzi. It would be beneficial for Aprilia and Moto Guzzi to stay in Mendelo Delario to share resources, research, and development between the two companies. And then four years later in 2004, Piaggio would purchase Aprilia, and thus with it, Moto Guzzi. And with that ownership, Moto Guzzi has been able to focus on a wide range of motorcycles, from classic cruisers to adventure bikes. It's funny that uh, we circled back around with Piaggio, ending up with Moto Guzzi. And that's it, guys. That is Moto Guzzi's history in a nutshell. If you like this kind of thing, hit subscribe, hit like, do whatever you'd like. I'll see you next week with another video.